Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you. All you need to do is give us a jingle at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980, and you can always send us an email during our live show, Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. Calm. Well, St. John Paul II called a young people to combat the culture of death and promote a culture of life. So today, we have some young people with us today. They are members of Crossroads Pro-Life. They will be on our show. And they are walking across the country in support of pro-life. Really walking. Really walking. Thousands and they of will share a little all about yeah. their travels. Yeah. And we are excited to have them with us. Well, these young people are a great inspiration. Perhaps uh, you're homeschooling your kids. They're watching today. We're praying that the Holy Spirit will continue to move upon young people. It's happening today, perhaps as never before really understanding about the sanctity and dignity of the human person, wanting to proclaim the gospel of life. Maybe this call to crossroads, being involved in a journey like this, a pilgrimage like this, is something that they'll do now or, or in the future. This, this apostolate really rose up, as you said, through John Paul II, St. John Paul II now. And when he came to Denver um, and had World Youth Day, mm -hmm. I think in 1993 or so, and uh, it was supposed to be a big failure, World Youth Day, by the way, in Denver, and it was just absolutely incredible. So these youth came from all over the country, different parts of the world, and Father John, uh, Father John, uh, Pope John Paul II, as we know, was on fire with mm -hmm. the gospel of Christ, with the gospel of life, that particular aspect of the gospel that deals with the sacredness and dignity of the human person and confronting assaults upon life. And he spoke to these young people prophetically, profoundly, joyfully loving them and great things happened. Many mm -hmm. people came out of this call to the religious life, right. priesthood, just consecrated themselves. And I think this ministry of Crossroads came we out of this yeah. with a young man who may not have been there, but you know, followed what was going on. I was inspired to begin this. I want to just share some of the words that John Paul uh, spoke when he came to Denver. He said to the young people, the church needs your enthusiasm your youthful ideas in order to make the gospel of life penetrate the fabric of society. At this stage in history, the liberating message of the gospel of life, it's been put into your hands. Young people, the gospel of life is put into your hands for this time. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have life abundantly. Young people from every corner of the world in ardent prayer, you have opened your hearts to the truth of Christ's promise of new life. Young pilgrims, you have also shown you understand that Christ's gift of life is not for you alone. You've become more conscious of your vocation and mission to the church and to the world. He said, I have great confidence in you. We need to place confidence in our young people that they'll understand this gospel of life and that they'll go with it. I have great pride in you. I'm overflowing with joy, John Paul said, for you. So much depends upon you. Go out into this world, go out into the highways, into the byways, and be a light that shines so that people can see the path for life and go. Invite everyone to the banquet table that God has prepared for his people. And young people have been answering that call. Mm -hmm. Crossroads has answered that call. The first person from Steubenville who, who heard this began this walk. And so I hope that today, again, more people we will come forward and take up the gospel of life and transform this culture of death into a new culture of life. And they, they you know, they participate, they make a great sacrifice, they come out and they, they start, you know, in the summer, they usually start over in San Francisco and they walk all the way Washington, over to Washington, D.C. So that's a lot, and that's a lot of time. That takes a lot of time to do, and they have a great team, and they, they all get together, and it's just absolutely wonderful. So they're gonna be sharing just about their sacrifice that they're making this summer for the gospel of life. Well, we have a great show lined up, and we're gonna have, when we come back, we're gonna hear from Donna Marie Cooper O'Boyle, and she has a tip on how we can share the faith with our children 
at the dinner table. And when we come back, we're going to have these four young people who had taken a great stand for the Amen. gospel of life, said yes, yes to Jesus, yes to the great call. What am I supposed to do with my life? What am I supposed to do with my summer? Go out and make a bold witness for the gospel life, of life. Life, marriage, and family will prevail. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome to Feeding Your Family Soul. What's on the menu? Become a beacon of light. The Catechism reminds us that from the beginning, the core of the Church was often constituted by those who had become believers together with all of their household. These families who became believers were islands of Christian life in an unbelieving world. Now look around you, not to be a bearer of gloom and doom, but I'm sure that we already know that we certainly live in a very darkened world. We need to ask ourselves, how does our light shine through the darkness? Here's some food for thought. One time when Mother Teresa was cleaning an elderly blind man's apartment, she came across a dusty old oil lamp covered in cobwebs. She cleaned it up and asked the man if he would light the lamp if the sisters would come to visit him. He said yes. So the sisters visited and brought so much joy to the once lonely man. And years later, the man wrote to Mother Teresa to say, the light that you lit in my life still shines. How about this recipe for your family? Ponder how you can be a brilliant light of faith to others. Simple things done with great love bring joy and sparks of hope. Consider that when you are out at a local diner, when your family bows their heads to say grace before meals, others who are observing are edified. You might even remind them about the need to pray. Volunteering at the local soup kitchen, taking time to talk about God to an unbelieving neighbor are other examples of simple ways to let your faith shine in the darkness. You will be setting a powerful example to others that can be a crucial spark of hope and a dynamic for change in their lives. As the church encourages, let us strive to be an island of Christian life in an unbelieving world. As well, let us never tire of praying for families everywhere in our world. Every family needs our prayers. Show your family you love them. Eat dinner together. Until we meet again, bye for now. God bless you. Well, thank you, Donna Marie. Well, welcome back. You know, you're an important part of our family and we want to hear from you. So if you have a question for any of our guests today who are members of the Crossroads Pro Life, give us a jingle during the live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com. Maybe you were a walker in the past. Maybe you have a story you want to tell of how it changed your life. Maybe you took a walk across America and you received a call from God, you know? So we want to hear from you. Well, Sydney Donovan is the director of Crossroads Pro-Life and her guests with her, we have Daniel Fansler, Irene Rosa, Benedict Slee, and they're volunteers, right? So the, those are the three college students. Two are from Texas, one is from Australia. And there, you can go to their website. It's called crossroadswalk.org. Well, we want to welcome you all to At Home with Jim and Joy. We're glad you're off the road, especially in Alabama. It's really hot here, so it's good to be in the cool air, right? Well, Sydney, I want you to first go around and introduce everyone. And then I want, when we come back, I want you to tell us the mission of Crossroads. Sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having us. It's good to be here. It's our privilege. Thank you. Um, my name is Sydney. I, uh, I'm 26 years old and I live in Alexandria, Virginia right now, but I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Okay. Um, and I've been in involved with Crossroads uh, on and off since 2014. Wonderful. 
Irene. My name is Irene Rosa. I'm 22 years old and I'm from Tyler, Texas. And this is the second time that I have walked with Crossroads. Okay. Benedict. G'day. G'day. Um, my name is Benedict C. I'm 24 years old and I'm from Sydney, Australia. And I've done Crossroads in Australia three times previously to doing this walk. So. Well, that's okay. a good day. Good day. <laughs> good day. Yeah. 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 I'm Daniel Fansler. I'm 21 years old and I'm from Fort Worth, Texas, and this is my first walk. Good. Great. We're going to hear more about how things are going for you all. But let's get, Joy mentioned the mission. We're interested in also the founding of this apostolate. I mentioned a little bit about it, uh, but can you tell us a little bit more about the inspiration for this and what took place to birth this? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, our mission, first and foremost, is obviously to save lives. Um, so we really offer up our prayers and our sacrifices and our witness to really build a culture of life, um, to really speak out against the, um, you know, the pains and the, the, um, the sufferings of abortion, mm -hmm. and to really speak for the dignity and the sanctity of every single human life, um, especially the unborn, but every life from conception until natural death. Um, and Crossroads has been around actually since 1995. Okay. Um, as you had mentioned, it's, it's <coughs> been around for over 20 years. And it was started simply by um, a couple students at Franciscan University, um, nam namely Steve Sanborn. Um, and it was just a couple friends who really, you know, sh had a big calling to answer uh, John Paul yeah. II's call to build a culture of life. Um, and really wanted to show the world that the church is alive within the youth, um, yes. especially the youth in America. Yeah. And um, so they simply decided that the best way to do that was to start yeah. at the very foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, of that fight, which is with the unborn, with innocent children in the womb. And so they went out to San Francisco, and I mean, the mission has been the same since then, to, to witness through our prayer and our sacrifice um, that life is worth fighting for. Yes. Well, it's amazing. You know, we heard a little bit of St. John Paul II's words in Denver. And so they've been with us for a number of years now, and we're more familiar with them. But to think of this fellow Steve that first heard them, whether he was there or he just heard them, this call to go to the highways, to the byways, to the crossroads, to the metropolis areas, and declare life. And there's a lot of ways to do that. But your organization, especially Steve, just said, I'm going to literally do that. We're going to literally do that. We're going to walk. We're going to go to the highways, to the byways, to the streets, to the crossroads, to the cities, and, and walk and incarnate this gospel of life um, and have big shirts that say <laughs> pro-life, pro -life, okay. <laughs> right? And to make visible that which is invisible, right? These little ones, this is the, the silent, the unseen, for the most part, Holocaust. And so you all have become visuals of that which can't be seen. And I would imagine that meets with applause and it meets with some disdain or or whatever you might be catching as you go along. Irene, you've been on two of these journeys? Yes, sir. Share mm -hmm. with us. Yeah, so what I really have come to find through Crossroads was that America is a lot more pro-life than, than it is portrayed. And it's just been very encouraging. Um, you would think that when you, yeah, when you, you have the expectation of receiving such an, like animosity, mm -hmm. um, and you don't, you really don't. You receive a lot of encouragement, and there are a lot more pro-life uh, people out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think it's, it's really a beautiful pilgrimage to be a part of, and I mean, it's why I'm on it again. Yeah. Um, when you say there are more pro-life people out there, what people are you speaking about? Because I'm envisioning you mm -hmm. walking yes, uh, on the streets, but then again, you also go to churches or other places mm -hmm. you're interacting. Let's just talk about the street for a mm -hmm. little bit and the people that you're bumping into. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think there too, as you have conversations or as they respond to you, you feel like you're meeting more people? Because you wouldn't get that impression sometimes from the media and yeah. everything else. But when you have a conversation about this or they say, you know, what are you doing, what's going on? Mm -hmm. You're finding that people are sympathetic to the movement. Oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, and even if they aren't, which again, it doesn't happen very often. They're very open-minded and willing to have conversations with us and to like hear why we are doing mm -hmm. what we are doing. Um, and it's just, again, it's just very encouraging. So even if we don't necessarily convert them on the spot or like God doesn't work in that, or he yeah. is working in that moment, mm -hmm. but it's not immediate. Yeah. Um, like it's just, 
we have to have faith that he is. And I mean, we can sh share a story. Um, yeah. One of the, the first time I walked, there was an assistant walk leader. His name was Alex Wilson. And he shared a story with us in 2013. Him and um, the walk leader were having lunch at a diner. And they, yeah, they were having lunch at a diner and they see this woman in, in distress and mm -hmm. she's sobbing. Um, and it's because she saw them. And so they're like, oh, mm -hmm. this could rather go one of two ways. Mm -hmm. Rather she's upset at us or, or she is in support of us. And so the walk leader goes up to her and he, to comfort her. And um, she goes, I've been looking for you for the last three years. And they looked at each other like, what do you mean? And he, she's like, well, I've been looking for you. I was on my way to have an abortion. I was really contemplating it. And I was praying to God on my way for one last final sign. Mm -hmm. um, to, is this the right thing for me to do? And as she was um, driving on the exit, she was, yeah, she was exiting the highway, the walkers walked by. Mm -hmm. A couple of crossroads walkers mm -hmm. were walking by. And, and she sees them and she didn't go to her appointment because mm -hmm. she had already had it scheduled. Mm -hmm. She then like turned around and motioned for a little girl to come over. And she said, this is Grace and I want you to meet, meet her. Like you saved her life three oh years ago. Wow. And so, yeah, yes. it's just oh, no, that, remarkable. It <laughs> is remarkable. And, and, and you don't know the witness that you have. And that happens yeah. even to sidewalk counselors. Yeah. You yeah. know, when they're out on the sidewalk and they're thinking, nobody came in here today, but they don't know the person who is bargaining with God yeah. on their way to the abortion clinic who saw people whose car drove by and never made it to the clinic that day. And they're is another human being on planet Earth making a difference for all eternity mm -hmm. because somebody showed up. Right. You know, and you think, it, does this matter? Yes, it matters for all eternity. Mm -hmm. That woman has a child grace. Yeah. And, and so never think, oh, my witness really yeah. doesn't matter. Who even mm -hmm. knows what pro-life means? What is that happening? You know, we're just walking and nobody even sees us. You know how the devil can come along mm -hmm. and discourage you. Mm -hmm. Right? And so you say, no, it, it does matter. What we're doing totally matters. Mm -hmm. Benedict, uh, you've participated in a walk here in America, yep. and then you've done a number of the uh, crossroads walks in Australia, plus you've participated in some other walks to lift up the Lord. What are your thoughts about this, about crossroads, and about what you're doing and the impact it's having on you and on those that you touch? So I think it's um, really good in particular for the youth in particular for the youth of Australia and America and the world, because um, there's also other crossroads walks in like Spain, Canada, and other international ones as well. Um, so particularly for me, um, I find that um, it's a really, in terms of for young people to have something that they can actually practically right. um, make a difference. Mm -hmm. Like they're going, what do I do with my summer? What do mm -hmm. I do with my holidays? And they go, well, I was, that's, that's how I kind of got involved is sort of through because um, I was always looking for something some sort of apostolate or some sort of mission to do but it was kind of like not really looking to commit for a whole year sort mm -hmm. of thing as such so a month or so three So this months. is about how long does this take? To so get? the one in America goes for 12 weeks 12 weeks. So basically three months. It's a long time to walk I tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> and then the one yeah. in Australia is about five weeks and slightly mm -hmm. short. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there's something good about a mission that has a beginning and an end. Mm. Like, what am I going to do with my summer? What am I going to do? You know, and of course you want to be pro-life all the days of your life. But particular missions, it's like it has a beginning, it has an end. Maybe you know, this is I could bite this off. I think. Yeah. 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 It's really a good experience, especially for young people, because um, you keep saying it's a good experience for young people. Why? What do they, why do they need this? Why is it good for them? So I first started out on Crossroads back when I first started in Australia, going sort of not really too much expectations. I'd seen some of the walkers at a host family where they were staying close by my house. It was sort of like, oh, that's interesting sort mm -hmm. of thing. Didn't really take much notice of it until like I knew what they were doing, cool. Um, but then as I was in college in Australia, Campion College, um, a few of the people there were going on it 
and they were like, hey, do you want to come? Mm -hmm. So I was like, sure, I'll go mm -hmm. on this walk. I've got nothing else that mm -hmm. I'm doing this summer. And um, it was a really great experience in terms of um, witnessing to witnessing what other sort of pro-life aspects there are, like mm -hmm. how abortion affects not just um, mothers and children, but also um, some of the encounters we had over there were with fathers who had um, um, been experiencing post-traumatic like grief from having mm -hmm. had abortions and mm -hmm. this like how it affects the whole community. So it's not just like mothers and That's babies, mm -hmm. those are the main ones, but there's also the whole community of grandparents, right. future children as well. So. Mm -hmm. Great, great point. So mm -hmm. that abortion affects and implicates everyone, that every abortion affects scores and scores of people whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. That life, that mother, that dad, what's taking place, the trauma, the shock waves, that's mm -hmm. what they say, the, the mm -hmm. shock waves. How they right. go out, right? Well Daniel, this is your first walk, you're a Texas guy, right? Where are you from yes, in sir. Texas? I'm from Fort Worth. Oh, Fort Worth, Texas? Yes sir. And so you've been on this now for since May. How you doing? Um, well, I'm doing good spiritually. It's exhilarating to be walking every single day um, with the single purpose of trying to spread the message of the pro-life movement yeah. to try to essentially save lives. Yeah. Um, but I mean, physically, I'm tired. It's walking across the country is a physical challenge, but um, we manage because it's suffering brings us closer to the Lord mm -hmm. and this type of suffering I'm happy to take mm -hmm. if even if it saves just one life mm -hmm. it's nothing is too big of a sacrifice for that yeah. you say suffering brings you closer to the Lord H how does that work its way out I mean this whole thing of abortion is a great <coughs> suffering and then you're suffering to some degree physically in what you're doing or the responses you get speak to us about this John Paul II would say the gospel of suffering. How is suffering good in any way? So many people say, no, it's really bad. We've got to avoid it at every cost, even some Christian traditions. What are you talking about? Well, I'm, I kind of see a parallel between the suffering of what we're doing to save lives and the suffering that Christ <laughs> endured to save us from death, the human race. Um, it's very clear. Christ gave an example of how we're supposed to live our lives, and it's very clear by his example that suffering is not necessarily a bad thing if mm -hmm. it's done for others mm -hmm. and which is what he did for us and so to suffer St. Paul writes to suffer is to come closer to Christ because we come uh, we become more unified to Christ's suffering through our mm -hmm. own suffering yeah. and so the idea of walking for hours and miles every single day to walking in 100 plus degree heat mm -hmm. um, most days to walking in extremely humid temperature, extremely humid climates, and then extremely dry climates yeah. brings all sorts of different types of sufferings, mm -hmm. but it's all worth it in mm -hmm. the end if it just but saves one life. Yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. So beautiful. Wow, th these are just absolutely critical learnings, you know, that, that you're getting about the faith, and I, I hope for all of the moms out there and children that are out there and, and homeschool people, and th this is this is what you want your children to come into and, and know, and I'm sure that they know it to some degree, but like, like you said, when you put shoe leather on what you're doing, and quite frankly, Benedict, it didn't sound like you had the highest reasons for doing this, going, yeah, I'll do it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like, but once you start doing it, right, it's kind of like, whoa. And so it might be that some people just get involved and say, well, I don't have anything to do for the summer, and God's like, got you. Yeah. Got your heart, got your mind, you're never gonna be the same you know, about this. Again, Sydney, explain to us, we just got a couple of minutes before the break, again, just the, the overall, how this works practically. How many groups go out? Where do you start? Where do you, and what is, how does this work? Sure, so this summer we have um, two different walks that are, that are going um, simultaneously. So we had a walk that started in San Francisco, and then our walk is the Southern Walk, and we started in Los Angeles. Um, and so basically what we do Monday through Friday is we split our team into, uh, in half. So we have a morning shift and an afternoon shift. And so the morning shift will go out at sunrise. Um, we drop two people off wherever the afternoon shift had left off okay. the day before. Um, and they walk two by two like the first apostles. And we'll drive forward in a support van about um, three, five miles. And um, 
in the van, you know, we'll talk, we'll get to know each other, pray, maybe sleep, who knows. Um, and the, uh, the two people walking will, um, you know, pray a rosary while they're walking and really just offer up that, that prayer and that sacrifice. And when they get to the van, um, they get in and, and then the next two people get out. Okay. And so we're constantly rotating like that throughout the day. Um, and then at some point, um, we'll meet up for daily mass, uh, which is just integral to our mission. I mm -hmm. mean, we, we try our very hardest to never miss a day of mass because, um, I mean, it's always been said that we wouldn't be able to do this without mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, really having Jesus Christ inside of us every single day, giving us that, that strength, that power to, move, to keep yeah. going, mm -hmm. um, it'd be impossible without it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really keep ourselves focused on that um, and of course, just a lot of prayers throughout the day yes. and, mm -hmm. you know, having fun too. Yeah. Um, Let's pause. Yeah, at this point, we're going to hear more about Crossroads <coughs> uh, Pro-Life Walk. It's crossroadswalk.org. Plenty of information there. You can find out how you can support uh, this movement in a variety of ways locally. Um, you can get involved with it in a variety of ways. Crossroadswalk.org. We want to hear from you. Plenty more to come. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, remember that we want you to be a part of our show. So if you have a question for the members of Crossroads Pro-Life, give us a jingle during the live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling us outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com and hopefully we'll use your wise question or your comment right here on the air. Well, we're speaking with Sydney and Irene and Benedict and Daniel. You could go to their website, crossroadswalk.org. And, you know, share, hearing your stories, knowing um, it is a great sacrifice, what you do is, you know, you say, this is what I'm going to do for the summer. You could be working, getting a job, you know, doing those kind of things. But this is um, a special calling. So there is an age group to this. So me, an old lady, I couldn't do this because you have an age group because you're really um, knowing that's the best time health reasons, right? Do you have to take a physical before we start this? I mean, do you have to have a good health report before you get going? Um, no, you don't. <laughs> um, some people will prepare by, you know, doing a little walking training. But for the most part, I think people kind of come out pretty open-minded. Mm -hmm. well, what is the age? 18? 18 to 30. 30, okay, so yeah. you should be in pretty good shape just yeah. being that yeah, young. Yeah, just being that young. <laughs> yeah, so Didn't we feel good at 18 and 30? I that did. That's our best years physically. <laughs> it's old now. Yeah, so definitely an emphasis on young adults. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the point being just um, just that the church is alive, you mm -hmm. know, with, with, with the young people um, is, is a really important thing to see. And I'd say probably one of the most humbling things that we experience is all the people who have been working, you know, over the last 40, 50 years, you know, in this movement, thanking us for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, in turn, we have to say thank them, you know, mm -hmm. for, for putting in all of these years and not necessarily always getting to see the fruits of their yeah. labor. Mm -hmm. you know? Can you speak to us about this phrase that you are survivors? You've heard that? You're survivors mm -hmm. since 1973. That's 44 years, I think, I hope. It's live TV, so if that's the best version. <laughs> About 40 something years. That your generation, 44 years, you were considered uh, not a person in utero. When I was in my mother's womb, I was considered a person. I was protected by the law, but for some reason now, you're no longer a person. And so we have almost 60 million abortions in the United States of America. So you look at the survivors. You could have been aborted or you, you get to survive your property, basically. Yeah. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. How does it make you feel? Uh, you want to undo that? You know, because I didn't grow up as a survivor. I think I would not have liked that term to be given to me. And I want to say, as an older person, please forgive us that we didn't hold to what we say we believe in the United States of America mm -hmm. 
that all of us are created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights. And the first and foremost right is the right to life. You have the right to life. This nation didn't give you that right. God gave you that right. And I'm sorry, as an older person who should have done more, how could this ever happen in our country anyway? What is that whole idea of being a survivor? How does that motivate you, or, or does it do anything for you, or, or what? Uh, Daniel, what do you think about that? I've honestly never thought about it that way. Well, you think about it now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I've been very blessed to come from a family where we haven't been touched by abortion directly. Like, as far as I know, no one in my family has ever had an abortion. Um, and so I've never had it yeah. direct directly involved in my life mm -hmm. um but the idea that i mean you're right that 60 million 60 wait 60 million yeah 60 Six, million 59 mm -hmm. or so yeah or so of my brothers and sisters right. in my generation have been wiped out right just because of well frankly evil is appalling and it's it's appall it's also appalling that more people aren't appalled by this mm -hmm. um enough to where there's just like I don't know, just a bunch, uh, just a bunch of like distress in widespread distress across the world mm -hmm. that this is happening. It's somewhat disturbing, but mm -hmm. that's why we're fighting is right. to change and, uh, that. And Thank being you, a Jim. presence out there. Yeah, well, I have an email and it says, I would love to participate in Crossroads Pro-Life Walk next year, but I need to work at least part time of the summer to raise tuition. Can I walk part way or do you require a commitment to the entire walk? And this is Becky from Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. So give us the scoop on how she can plug in. Sure, absolutely. That's a really great question. We get that a lot. Um, so, of course, we always encourage people to do the whole walk from start to finish. You know, there's something really sanctifying about that. But, you know, these days it's a reality that people can't commit their whole summer to <laughs> mm -hmm. something like this. Um, and so we accept people for as little as two weeks. Um, some people come out to walk for a month. Um, we had two girls from Mexico, Mexico come up and walk with us for about two weeks mm -hmm. this summer, and it was awesome. Yeah. And so um, for Becky, I really encourage her to reach out to us. Um, she can go to our website, and um, we have an application process and everything like that. And um, we really like to work with people because it's such an awesome experience. And um, for whatever time she could commit, that would be wonderful. Good. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Benedict, what's going on in Australia regarding pro-life, abortion, your law? what's happening down under? So recently there was um, a bill put forward for law um, in Queensland as well as another similar one in New South Wales and both of those laws would have legalised abortion up to birth for any reason. Um, it put in place buffer zones which means people couldn't pray, protest or anything outside of abortion facilities for 150 metres, otherwise mm. they'd face fines of $16,000 or 12 months in jail. And it also, both of those would have taken away conscientious subjection for doctors. So they'd be forced to refer um, patients on to someone who would perform an abortion. Um, so currently in Victoria, um, the state that I'm from, um, they've got laws similar to that. Um, up to 40 weeks mm. with um, buffer zones, mm. but there's slightly, um, there's a little small um, clause or something in there, which means I think two doctors or something have to sign off mm -hmm. um, for anything over um, 24 weeks mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. But they've got two abortion workers right. and they can just sign that off. Right. And it's basically abortion on demand. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But um, the two bills that were in New South Wales and Queensland were defeated um, overwhelmingly and there's mm -hmm. a strong pro-life movement there in the, at the moment mm -hmm. with them. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things we encountered, first of all, being young is a great thing. The first thing you need to do the day you turn 18 is register to vote. Because if you walk across America and then you don't cast your vote, <laughs> I mean, that's, there's more power to you, right? And so you have to, I mean, when our kids literally woke up, 18, they yeah. woke up, their father had a voter registration form <laughs> for did. them. Yeah. And then when their <laughs> friends came to our house, they had to register to vote. 
because it's one thing to be young and to be even active, but then you want to participate in the political process because what we do makes a difference. Laws change and save lives, you know? Um, that, that buffer zone, we had one of those here at an abortion clinic. In Birmingham, we had seven abortion clinics, just seven, that was a lot. Now we're down to one. The state of Alabama has five abortion clinics, and this is the heart of Dixie. This is gospel land, right? But in this state, we killed last year over 9,000 babies. And so that's what you say, well, but I live in the South and everyone's a Christian. And well, no, you know, we still kill babies. Well, and so we all have to be involved. But the other point is that the majority of people are Christians. The majority of people having abortions are Christians. Mm -hmm. Now we might say, well, what kind of Christian are they if they do that? Um, well, you can look through the Bible and see a lot of people that were a part of Judaism and so on, and, and, and we commit sins, we do things. So we find at our center, Crisis Pregnancy Center, 80 to 85% all claim Christianity, um, and they can be Christians. I mean, God only knows in the end, but they're caught in this situation and feel like they have no option. So, so a lot of it is we've got to do a better job in the church, lifting up the sanctity of human life like you're doing, and the sanctity of marriage, which is everything flows from that, that vessel of commitment and saying we only get to engage in this sacred act if we're in this vessel called marriage. And some of us violate that, but then we've got to repent and come back. Anyway, my point, babe, Joy, mm -hmm. is, is that, yeah, you, right. we know it mm -hmm. for a fact. Well, we're all Christians, but we don't act like it. And maybe there's other areas in our lives where we're not acting like it. So when these people come in to us, we, we can't say to them, well, aren't you a Christian? Like, well, what's going on? And then we've got, to, we've got to talk it through and say, we're not going to leave you. We're here with you as, as a community. Do we have another email? I have another email that says, I watch the March for Life and Walk for Life each year on EWTN and some of the counter protesters. Do you have any problems with some people who are protesting you? And if so, how do you handle it? And this is Jenny from Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Anybody want to answer that question? Have you ever had any counter protesters, people not be nice to you? Well, on the Southern Walk, um, we haven't had too many problems uh, with people opposing what we're doing. I mean, it, usually in like the states where abortion is more available, like in California and New mm -hmm. Mexico, we had um, more opposition to us, but even then it wasn't anything major. Mm -hmm. Like we got, as we were walking, we got flipped off a few times by people in cars who would mm -hmm. then just drive away mm -hmm. without saying a word. Mm -hmm. A couple people cuss at us. Um, use profanities against us, but we haven't really had anything major mm -hmm. like horror story happen right. to us yet. Most yeah. people have been supportive of yeah. what we're doing. They give right. us thumbs up and they honk at us like in supportive ways right. um, as we're walking. Yeah. It's been, it's, it's, America is more pro-life than what the media is portraying. Yeah, it I'm to seeing be. this in mm -hmm. your writings and so on, and it's kind of like hard to believe for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. Tell us more, because that's so encouraging, and that's a part of the lie. To, to make us um, you know, feel dejected and down and like we're, we're losing. And we're the minority. Yeah. So you, mm -hmm. you really speak more to that, because Irene was sharing about that as well, mm -hmm. that you're finding so many pro-life people or people open. Yeah, certainly. And um, I mean, we can see that in, because on Saturdays, typically on the weekends, we'll be in the big cities to um, stay there and fundraise. And usually on Saturdays, we go to a nearby abortion facility to pray outside of it. Um, it's sort of what we do and lately I mean for many of the states we haven't been able to do that because they just don't have any abortion mm -hmm. facilities around us mm -hmm. because they've all been closed down mm -hmm. because people have been fighting um, against this for years and yeah. they've been winning mm -hmm. and it's a I think it's a state um, of where we are in in the battle right now mm -hmm. and we're yeah as far as I see it we're winning. Yeah. That's correct. That's do you good. find that I've really changed my thinking about a lot of things as I've gotten older. and That's because you're wiser. Thank you, dear. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's kind of like I, I thought for people that are not agreeing with what I believe now regarding life, marriage, and family, I often see them as rebellious. But I'm learning that they're really not rebellious. They haven't even thought it through. Like they're not informed. So there were some people that are in rebellion, like they know and they're saying, no, I, I'm committed to this. But I'm finding that they're really very few. They really don't know if they say I I'm pro-choice, what they mean by that when you say I'm pro-choice, what do you really mean that you 
allow abortion, that you stand for abortion. Do you know what abortion is? Do you know what abortion does? Are you finding that there's a lot of people out there that are just kind of like informed, have really thought it through to kind of parrot back the phrases? Are you finding that, Irene? Do you see that? With yeah. your friends or even out there as you're walking or others, maybe even in the church. We've got pro-life people mm -hmm. and pro-choice people who claim to be Christians, Catholic in the church. Maybe they just yeah. don't know. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's a, it's, yeah, people just aren't informed. Yeah. Um, and that I think sometimes people get into situations and they are just really stuck on the pain and whatever it is that they're going through. Um, and that's, I mean, and it goes back to what you were saying before, um, how we need to meet them where they are. And we need to, to just love them and encourage them to, to look at their other options and to sit there and correct them in a way that isn't going to condemn them necessarily, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. be so judgmental. Yeah. Um, and I just think that that's definitely what's going to need to happen in order for us to, right. to like, allow God to work through us. Mm -hmm. Um, to be full of mercy, grace, because therefore the grace of God go I. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I mean, I meet with counsel, I meet with clients, you know, daily, and they'll say, well, I'm pro-life, but now mm -hmm. that I'm pregnant, like the rules change. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, I've, I thought I was pro-life, but now I'm in this situation, this is an unplanned pregnancy, and mm -hmm. I need to do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. um, and the beautiful thing is they get to come in and we can have the conversation where mm -hmm. we can really talk about the truth and the beauty of that. Well, here's a quick email. It says, where do you spend the night when you're on your walk? Do you camp? Do you stay with supporters? Or do you have some other form of shelter? And this is George from Grand Island, Nebraska. So where do you all sleep? Where, where do you get rest? So we have a 28-foot RV that we've uh, had with us uh, the whole journey. Um, so during the week, we stay in the RV. The guys pitch tents outside, and we just find RV parks along the way. Um, sometimes during the week we'll have a parish host us in their hall, so we'll sleep on the floor or we'll have families that'll welcome us into their homes. Sometimes even people that we just run into at daily mass, mm -hmm. um, which is so amazing. And then on the weekends, uh, we stay with host families, so that's all sort of set up okay. um, before the summer kind of starts. Because showering is important. It is very important. Yeah, <laughs> like if you're out there and Glad it's really that hot, before the show, by the you way. Know, and you're really out there and you're like, ugh, I just need a shower, but <laughs> there's like, you know, like where's all that going to happen, Let's right? Let's pause at this point. Uh, great to see young people like this standing for life, and it seems more and more that the majority of young people in the United States of America for the gospel of life is crossroadswalk.org plenty more to come we'll be right back please don't go away Well, you are an important part of our family, and you know, you, you hear me say, we would love for you to join us live on At Home, and I mean it. We would love for you to come and be a part of our studio audience. All you need to do is contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department, send them an email, pilgrimages at EWTN.com, give them a jingle at 205-271-2966. In our audience today, we have people from Michigan and Massachusetts. People are from all over, and we are glad that they are here, and always go to the shrine to visit <clears throat> Mother's Resting Place. Well, Monday, we told you how EWTN is filming an exciting new documentary featuring a group of young Catholics as they journey along the Camino de Santiago in Spain, also known as the Way of St. James. And they have now crossed over from Portugal into Spain. And to give us an update right now is Colin Flynn and Jeremy Rivera. So let's hear what they have to say. It was 6 a.m. when we left Tui this morning. Someone suggested half four to leave at. No. No. That was a bad idea. We left at 6 a.m. It was dark, but it was absolutely beautiful as we walked through the narrow, winding streets in the village and then made our way out to the countryside as we continue to walk the Camino. We're a few days in now. We're taking the Portuguese route, but we've crossed over the border. We're now in Spain. This is Jeremy Rivera. He is the producer from Little J Productions. What does Little J stand for? 
Jesus. Little Jesus Productions. Yeah, Why right. did you call it that? I don't know. It was the domain was available. So <laughs> <laughs> there's the reason. You're producing, directing this program for EWTN. It'll be an hour-long special on St. James. What do you want the viewers at home to take away from it? Well, I think that over over time, for whatever reason, we've kind of become biblically illiterate. And we've forgotten who the disciples were. And we all know that maybe Jesus had 12, but within that 12, there was this inner circle of Peter, James, and John. And we're here to learn about James, uh, who was the brother of John. And he kind of had a private audience to some really cool things in the Gospels that the other disciples didn't get to see, like the Transfiguration or Jesus suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane or mm -hmm. some of the miracles. And so... Um, one particular thing that really strikes me about him is at one point he went from, you know, kind of not having a heart for people that were on the margins or outside of the church, if you will, to coming all the way to Spain to preach the gospel. And it's like, how did that transformation happen, right? It happened along the way. It was a journey. I think that there's a process to all of us in our faith. Mm -hmm. And thank God that he's patient and kind. <laughs> Because we need it on this trip. We need it because uh, we're all just in different stages and I think God's inviting us to go to that next level. And what better way to make a program about St. James and tell his story by doing the Camino and talking to the pilgrims along the way. These are all our pilgrims. Morning, everybody. Morning. They haven't had their coffee yet, but that's okay. This is Shante. Shante, where are you from? I'm from Dallas, Texas. And why did you come all the way from Dallas, Texas to Spain to do the Camino? Um, to find a new path. When we were walking this morning in darkness and in silence, what was going through your mind? What were you thinking about? Um, I was kind of thinking of the tragedies, the recent tragedies of my friends, and okay. also um, just really focusing on Father's intentions. We had switched intentions this morning, so I'm really praying for um, the people in his life. Mm -hmm. But so far, so good. Yes, so far, so good. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to keep up on how Shante is doing and the rest of the pilgrims and see some behind the scenes clips and photographs, you can check it all out. Where, Shante? EWTN.com. EWTN.com or our Facebook page. <laughs> check us out on Facebook and we'll talk to you very soon from the Camino. Well, that was so wonderful. Hun, I want to do that. That's on my bucket list. I'm getting tired between them walking, <laughs> them walking. <laughs> but uh, it's so beautiful, you know, because it what, what is this walk about? We're all on the journey. And where are we going? Hopefully heaven. Amen. That's our goal, That's right? Our goal. And so we're all on a journey, whether we're on crossroads, whether we're doing the El Camino, or whether we're just getting up in the morning and maybe just going to the restroom and coming back to the bed because that's the stage that we are in our life. That's the journey that we're on. So it's a good thing. And then to have the beautiful outside visible witness of it all reminds us that we're all pilgrims. Well, Sydney, tell us why. Why do you do this? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think that my journey in the pro-life movement started when I was really, really young. Um, when I was 12, I had, I found out that my mom had had an abortion um, about two years before she had my oldest sister. And when she told us for the first time, um, I could see the pain and the anguish that she had carried with her for, at the time it was like 18 years. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, I mean, as a 12 year old, I knew how wrong it was, how how people shouldn't be suffering like that. So I wanted to put myself in a position where I could either um, help people avoid that sort of suffering or at least put myself in a position <laughs> to help them heal from it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and through a lot of different paths, I found crossroads. And the beautiful thing about it is, like Irene was saying, just meeting people exactly where they are yeah. with that love and that compassion and, and forgiveness, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. um, it's so important. And I actually, I just recently talked to my mom um, and I was telling her that we were coming on the show mm -hmm. and I said, I want to talk about this. This is something that I know has affected me. Mm -hmm. And she said, um, yes, talk about it. That's and beautiful. she and she's ready to seek healing wow. and she wants to talk <laughs> about it. And Go it's ahead. just there's there's definitely hope for women out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. So much support. Yes. Redemption. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, just quick thought because uh, we're running out of time. Just why you're involved or why should people be involved? You want? I think Crossroads is a beautiful way to advocate not only for the unborn, but also to advocate for women and to convert the hearts of people who are working in the facilities. Um, it's just the perfect organization, maybe perfect, <laughs> but the perfect orga organization mm -hmm. to be a part of because it kind of touches like people anywhere and like anywhere that they are in their lives. And 
yeah, you may not see the fruits of your labor that summer that you're walking, mm -hmm. but three, de three years down the road, you right. could. How beautiful. Yeah. That's a great story. Benedict, why should uh, people get involved, especially young people? Um, well, we're all pretty much called to mission, so I encourage people to go out on mission, especially like a mission like Crossroads, where like you're literally going, walking like the first apostles and mm -hmm. going out there, sowing seeds, and even, at, even if, like as Zorian was saying, you may not see the fruits of your labor, <coughs> you're there to sow seeds, seeds of hope, seeds of encouragement, and seeds which will hopefully save lives. Mm -hmm. so. Daniel, closing thought? Um, well, yeah, the apostolic nature is certainly a very important feature about Crossroads, and it's what enticed me to join Crossroads. But certainly the most important part is that each one of us here has given up our summer to serve God, and that's the most important thing, I think, is that we are the servants of God, and we would do anything um, if it's to spread His great, His great name throughout the country. Thank you so much for being Thank with you. us, sharing about this Crossroads wonderful, wonderful ministry. We see the face of Christ in your faces shining through. You give us great hope. Remember that every Catholic is called to be an evangelist, a missionary of the gospel of life, and you are sent by God to evangelize the world right where you are. God bless you. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.